Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burrus. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Christopher J. Fettweiss, Associate Professor of Political Science at Tulane University. His new book is Psychology of a Superpower, Security and Dominance in U.S. Foreign Policy. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. A lot of your book is about the concept of unipolarity and in a foreign policy world. What does that mean? Uh, And are we in a unipolar world? Unipolarity just means that there's one dominant power in the system. Uh, For political scientists, uh, polarity refers to the distribution of power. So during the Cold War, we had a bipolar system where we had two roughly equal powers. And and before World War I, there was a multipolar system. By most people's estimates today, we have a unipolar system. One country is strong enough to make and enforce the rules on everybody. Now, what happened to American foreign policy thinking and on that period after the Soviet Union when you thought we would just sort of sit back and say, wow, we've been spending on our military for 50 years in order to fight the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is gone. Uh, what happened when we became a unipolar world? Yeah, you'd think that after the Soviet Union collapsed, we could have rethought a lot of things about a lot of aspects of our foreign policy and our spending and our national security because we got a lot safer. But we don't seem to have believed that we've gotten safer. We don't seem to perceive safety, which is a bit strange because the threats we face now, any diplomats of any prior era would love to have our problems. The, threat, the threats we face now are relatively minor, especially compared to the Soviet Union. But we are the most f- fearful country and we're the most f- f- afraid country in the world in a lot of ways. And that which doesn't make any sense. So what I've been trying to figure out for a few years is why that is. Why are we so scared of the Iranians and the North Koreans and Al Qaeda and ISIS? And uh, it, there's a lot of different reasons, but it, it, it all come back to our power. So the Soviet Union has gone, but – doesn't China counterbalance our power a bit? A bit, and regionally. They don't have the, the capability of projecting power across the Pacific. They could make thing, make life more difficult for us in the in the South China Sea and the various areas right around the, right around China, which we might ask, well, why do we care much what happens there anyway? But that's a different story. The Chinese, though, don't have the capability of projecting power around the world. And don't seem to have the interest, frankly, to do it like we do. They don't have the they don't have a blue water navy to any real extent that we do, and uh, they don't. Even though they're increasing their spending in, on their military, it's not at nearly the pace that they could if they were if they felt more threatened than, uh, by us than uh, the, than we as we perceive them to. If the world then is less dangerous now than it was when we were locked in the Cold War. Why do we seem so convinced? And by we, I mean maybe both the the foreign policy establishment, but also just you know ordinary Americans that that the world is a dangerous place and an increasingly dangerous place. That's a great question. I've been trying to figure out that out for a while, and I think the some of the answers are in just sort of basic human psychology. That the strongest members of any group tend to be the ones that are worry that worry more, especially the strongest countries worry more because they assume that there are bad actors out there scheming against them. Uh, We seem to be hardwired to not be able to relax or not be able to recognize safety. And there may be some aspects of U.S. culture too, U.S. society. We're a much more religious society than most, for instance. And religious people tend to see, are comfortable with notions of good and evil that make other other people a little bit queasy. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. But if we are, we seem to be culturally incapable of recognizing that we're pretty safe and secure. And because of that, we do a lot of stupid things. We get into a lot of unnecessary conflicts and unnecessary problems because we think we're in such danger. But the world, so the world in this unipolar setup that it's in now is, you've said it's, it's whether we believe it or not, it's safer. Um, and, and so maybe it's a good thing that we might think it's not or that we might think there's lots of threats because that would encourage us to keep being powerful, which might maintain the unipolar world. So can we – I guess the question is can we trace the the, peace, the relative peacefulness of the world now to the United States being the single dominant factor? And, and if the United States stopped thinking that there were threats, would it then jeopardize that a bit if we kind of backed off some? Well, that's a great question. And that's one of the big outstanding issues in U.S. foreign policy. What would happen if we were to cut back on our presence and our spending and our activism abroad? And there are some people, especially sort of the neoconservatives, who will tell you that 
the only thing standing in between chaos around the world and ab abject you know, genocide and total destruction of the liberal order is, is U.S. power, which strikes me as a bit of an odd statement. We don't have that gigantic of a Navy, for instance. We have a couple of hundred ships, but they're not. They wouldn't be able to keep peace at sea unless sea is, the sea was already pretty peaceful. And that we, we don't have enough power that we would be able to stop, say, the Europeans from fighting if they really wanted to. Uh, it, it could well be that we have this large, expensive police force out there that is patrolling a relatively stable beat. You know, that, that is the, the world is itself is much less violent than it has been in any earlier era, which is a statistic that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. But people may other people may not be that there's much less warfare going on in the world now than ever before. Whether or not that's because we are patrolling the world or there's other factors going on at the same time is 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 not clear to me at all. And it's an it's it, it would be more rational to let's to test that, to cut back a little bit and see if violence starts to spread, to see if the if, if the old rules start to come back in, because I'm not convinced at all that it's our power and our presence that keeps everybody else from fighting. We're not that strong. So that sounds, though, like a potentially pretty costly experiment. I mean, if if what we're talking about is whether or not the U.S. being, you know, strong and involved is keeping the peace, if if we're if you're wrong that it's you know that it's in fact not the U.S. but the U.S. maintains its its strength and presence and the peace continues great um, because it certainly doesn't seem to be making at least as you've articulated so far things more violent. But if the U.S. were to step back to to test the hypothesis. That the cost of you being wrong might be high in human lives. It could be disruptive if done wrong, if done fairly stupidly. Like with, I don't know if we ever say have a president who has no diplomatic tact at all, and it makes in, <laughs> and alienates allies around the world and dislocates uh, or you know, injects uh, chaos into alliance relationships. Maybe if it were, however, done <laughs> relatively slowly, if it were done cautiously. And step in a piecemeal fashion that could be easily reversed. If we, I would suggest that if, for instance, if the United States were to pull back a bit from Northeast Asia, that it's unlikely the North Koreans would go on a rampage and try to reunify that peninsula by the force of arms. But we could we could get there. We could get back there pretty quickly, though, if they do try. It's not the case that uh, that pulling back towards, say, the United, even just pulling back our forces closer to the United States would mean that we can't get back there quickly if we needed to. We can fly around the world pretty quickly these days. This isn't the, you know, the Roman Empire. Where it took three months to walk up to Gaul. We can get anywhere pretty quickly. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we would be abandoning the world. Nobody thinks we should wall ourselves off and stop trading. Well, a few people think that. I guess some do these. They stop trading and stop interacting with the world. But it's just like, you know, I think we're, we're getting to an age. I'm getting to an age where I have back problems. And there's no back problem that surgery can't make worse. And, they, and there's, there's really no U, international problem. The U.S. intervention can't make worse. And I, I think that if we stop thinking of ourselves as the first and second line of defense of democracy abroad, the, the, the other problems may sort themselves out. And it might not only be cheaper, but be better in the long run. You write about how there's a strange nostalgia for the Cold War amongst especially the foreign policy establishment. And I think that that the foreign policy establishment, I mean the DC foreign policy world, are kind of the people you're writing about here because you mentioned many times that there's a big disconnect between scholars, academics like you who write about foreign policy and the people who work in foreign policy in Washington, D.C. And the people here in Washington, D.C. tend to be kind of chicken littles to, for lack of mm -hmm. a better term. And one of the things that they do is they, they reminisce fondly to the Cold War and how wonderful it was that we had 30 – thousand, I think, Russian missiles pointed at our head. And I think one of the metaphors you bring up is it used to be locked in a room with a cobra, and now we're locked in a room with a bunch of bees, and it's even worse. Uh, why do you think it is that people think that the Cold War, I, I lived through a little bit of it, I don't remember it that well, but why do people think that the Cold War was, was such a great time? This is That's such a great question. Nothing drives me crazier than nostalgia for the Cold War, especially among people who lived through it. Who knew what it was like? Who knew, number one, how much daily violence there was around the world, how many proxy wars were going on? And number two, how the danger that we all felt 
that any time, now we know, it came close a couple times when there were either mistakes or rogue morons that uh, were that could have could have pushed the wrong button or could have just got us into more issues and brought it all tumbling down. No one who lived through 1983, now we know about the Able Archer scare, should have any nostalgia for the Cold War, but they do. You hear it over and over again. And I, and I talk about in the book about how there are psychological explanations for this. Uh, first of all, we know how it came out. We know we won, and so we can look back. And things always look better in retrospect. Ah, oh, we, rem we remember the good times, remember the good things, the good emotions. But the scary things tend to fade. The emotions that came with fear, the kids going to bed at night we're worrying about nuclear war like I did, and I imagine a whole uh, generations, generations did before me, uh, they, that fades. But we know we won. We had this sort of uh, clear morality to it. There was the bad guys and the good guys. And now we don't know necessarily who the bad guys are. We know that we have small regional bad guys. We seem like the world is coming apart at the seams and people have nostalgia, including some really senior people. Uh, Martin Dempsey, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, used to say this is the most dangerous the world has ever been in his lifetime. Which, you, what is he talking about? There were so many more dangerous moments during the Cold War and not just dangerous for local local people around the world, which they certainly were, but for, say, the species than there are now. We don't have a capability, it seems, to appreciate how much better things are getting. And both people on the right and the left will reject the positive news that comes in. Uh, Steven Pinker's written a couple of great books talking about how in most aspects, life around the world, the system is getting better. But people have this visceral reaction to it. They they attack the notion that things can get better. They think, well, that we can't let down our guard. Well, fine. But we, we should be somewhat happier than in previous times. And then it, it's, it has a practical implication because if we recognized how relatively safe we are, we might not go abroad doing such stupid things. This puts me in mind also of Carl Schmidt. Um, and and there's, there's this notion that you see, like David Brooks, I think epitomizes this, of, you know, without... Without a, a grand enemy, we can't have a sense of common purpose that we we need. You know, that it's not just that we overestimate how much better, or we underestimate how bad things were back then, and underestimate how much things better are now. But that this kind of is there like a psychological angle to it too of the the Cold War gave us purpose. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a bunch. Of, there are a lot of psychologists who think that people need to have an enemy to function. Because we all need to know we're the good guys, we're the good people. But and there's no point in being good if there's no corresponding bad. There has to be evil out there, and and there are there's a very clear pattern of how that evil manifests itself into the to an enemy, and and we see right now people are quite happy to have Iran as the enemy. The focus of all of our anxiety and all of the evil in the world is the Iranians. It, which, despite the fact that they're manifestly weak, they can't do much of anything. They can't project power outside of the Gulf region. But we think of them, or some people in this country think of them as the replacement for the Soviet Union. There's a great article that just came out a couple of days ago. Now, I forget exactly where. It was talking about how the Israelis, the, or the people in Israel have a higher level of happiness, of sort of general societal happiness than most other countries. And they're, they're Authors were saying yes because they have an enemy. They have they they know they're com they're united in a struggle. They have a they, it brings them together and people have a purpose for their lives. And a lot of times, the enemies give us that. So we feel better sometimes deep down, perhaps, but we feel better when we have an enemy, at, w upon which to focus all of our hatreds and maybe self-loathing and all sorts of things. But at least there's somebody we know we hate, and that seems to be ubiquitous in the world and it's and in, and in, it's just in humanity and certainly in the United States. Yeah, we also have a bad we're be very bad at understanding our enemies because of where we sit in the world is is you write a bunch of years a quote you have from Ronald Reagan's autobiography which uh, I just want to read a little bit of it cuz it struck me as amazing. It, quote, perhaps this shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. I'd always felt that from our deeds, it must be clear to anyone that Americans were immoral people who were starting at the birth of our nation had always used our power only as a force for good in the world. During my first years in Washington, I think many of us took it for granted that the Russians, like ourselves, considered it unthinkable that the United States would launch a first strike against them, that, that we assumed that the Russians knew that there's no way we would attack them. And, and this is the kind of 
way that we think about our enemies that is extremely damaging. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very common psychological phenomenon that sometimes is referred to as the overestimation of benevolence. We think, we, we know we're good down deep, we're good people. Therefore, we generally sense that other people, other countries, see us as good too. That they know that our intentions are good. Sometimes we'll screw up, but we're at the root good people, and we're trying to do the right thing. That is not how other countries perceive, how countries perceive one another. In fact, it's sort of quite the opposite, that if you need a general rule in international politics, the other is always a realist. The other country, whoever it is, they only are interested in power and you can't trust their words, but you, they're certainly only interested in maximizing their strength. Like we think of Putin and China and Iran, they, they, they are just trying to maximize their power and they're in the regions and around the world. They're cool headed realists. They're not and they, they're not any more complicated than that. And that's certainly how countries see us. Good luck convincing anybody in the Arab world that we invaded Iraq for anything other than oil uh, because they see us as a realist. That's just that's ubiquitous in human in human society. The, uh, the other countries are realists, but we don't see it that we assume that they know we're good. Reagan assumed the Soviets knew we were at heart good people, which seems you know a bit it would have certainly surprised the Soviets. But it wouldn't surprise psychologists who study this overestimation of benevolence. And related to that is the fundamental attribution error, uh, which you, which is that your opponents are acting in concordance with their character. Correct? Right. Anything they do Versus reflects you. their character. But when we do bad things, it's because we've been forced into it by events. Right? We had really no choice. And everyone should understand that this isn't what we wanted to do, but it was forced upon us by our situation. And the psychologist for it does, it's so widespread, it's the fundamental attribution error, that when they do something, it's a reflection of their character. But when we do something, it's a reflection of what, of, you know, of what was going on at the time of the situation we found ourselves in. How has unipolarity affected the second nuclear age, as you describe it, in, in a world where there are fewer nukes than there were in the Cold War, but but we seem to be more scared of it. Yeah, that. for about 15 years, people in my business have been writing about the second nuclear age with the general feeling that it's going to be worse than the first nuclear age, which was the Cold War. The Cold War was the first nuclear age, and now this one is going to have new rules. We're going to have a lot more actors. They're going to give the, they won't be trustworthy actors with nuclear weapons. They're going to give these weapons over to terrorists, maybe, and there's a good chance they might use them. It's a new nuclear world out there. However, so far, all the evidence says, yeah, it's a new nuclear world and it's much better. We have 90, we've gotten rid of about 90% of the nuclear weapons we had during the Gulf War. We've had, I'm sorry, during the Cold War. We've had, we have not had a great deal of proliferation. In fact, during the Cold War, we had nine nuclear states and now we have nine because this, South Africa gave them up and North Korea has, is, the, is the only country that has joined the nuclear club. There hasn't been runaway proliferation. There hasn't been anybody sharing them with, with the terrorists. There hasn't been use. So yeah, it's a new nuclear age, but it's better. And I don't understand, one of the many things I've been trying to understand is why are we so pessimistic about the, new, the future of nuclear weapons when all the trends are, what well, we'd say, positive. So early in our conversation, Trevor mentioned something that you've argued you know, that there's this huge disconnect between what the, the foreign policy establishment, the people who are doing foreign policy within Washington think about the world, think about these issues and what you and other and academics and people who, who study foreign policy but aren't part of that establishment, the, the consensus among you um, and it – it seems to me related to you know one of the things that we notice is you'll presidential candidates will frequently run as if not doves at least you know we we shouldn't have as many wars we shouldn't get you know i'm i'm not going to i'm not going to bomb all these countries the way my predecessor did um Barack Obama seemed to be a, a good example of this and then then they get into office and shortly thereafter they're bombing everybody um, and and seem to be just as belligerent as the guy who came before. And so we might on the one hand say that's because of all these psychological issues that you, you've lift, listed out. But is it possible that it's simply because since they are in Washington um, and they are, they are like the ones actually doing this stuff and so they are out there engaging in the world and know about what's going on in the world, that the world is simply 
a scarier place than you know because you're not privy to the same information they are? I mean, it's possible. Sure, they, and uh, that's certainly what uh, people in the intel business who I, I'm sure you've run into many people in Washington who love to tell you that if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't be so happy. But, you, you know, I've never really found out what they know that would make me scared. And I sure there's going to be details. John Mueller from Cato he's, uh, often talks about how if you know, all you do is if you're exposed to classified information about terrorism all day, it's sort of like sitting in the basement with a police band radio. You would never leave your house. But if you look at the aggregate trends, the overall data of what's actually happening and get outside of the beltway, get outside the bubble, things are pretty good. I tell my students all the time, look at Europe. Europe is the most peaceful part of the world right now. That's weird. That's historically weird. You know, Jefferson called them an arena of gladiators. And now it's the most peaceful area in the world. I'm German by, by ethnicity and my people aren't peaceful, but now they are. Something's going on in the world. Maybe it's the United States making, all, making for instance, the entire Western Hemisphere to be at peace. Uh, there's no civil war, ethnic conflicts or any wars of any kind going on in the Western Hemisphere for the first time since at least the 17th century. Nobody seems to care. So I'm not sure what people could be learning when they get there. I think much more likely is they just kind of get socialized into ways of thinking rather than exposed to different kinds of intelligence. Because the people around the White House, they don't have access to any kind of scary intel, but they do have a very clear notions that. Ben Rhodes, a former administ Obama administration official, used to call the blob very clear notions about how in, in, in absolutely in, in inevitable it is for the United States and important it is for us to be active everywhere. Uh, but so it could just be being socialized into the thoughts rather than scared by the intel. You argue in the book that it could be the case or, or it is the case. I don't think it's necessarily so, but I think there's a tendency, you argue, for the powerless, the relatively powerless nations to be better at forming. And of course, I'm putting the nations don't have beliefs, but the people in these nations, but those nations are better at forming accurate beliefs uh, than people in the unipolar power, such as the United States. Why would that be? Yeah, the there, there's some some reason to believe out there that power is indirectly related to wisdom. That when that either strong individuals or strong countries, when they they might perceive reality much differently than people who are weaker. And just give you one example, the, the strong don't have to worry about the weak as much. The strong don't have to worry and put themselves in the position of, of lesser actors. So they're not as good as at empathizing, of understanding others, because they don't they're not encouraged to spend much time trying to figure others out. So whether it's a CEO and there's a lot of sort of business uh, literature about this stuff, the people high up in companies are not as good at understanding other people than people lower down in the in the corporate la on the corporate ladder. So the same thing happens in the international system. The United States is never going to be as good at understanding other countries as they are at understanding us because they have an incentive to try to figure out what we're doing. And good luck, by the way, figuring out what we're doing now. But they, we have very little incentive to try to figure out what the Albanians are up to. At least, you know, maybe there's a few people in the State Department who do. But we, our empathy suffers. And there's a lot of other things that, you know, that help out little Gol Davids when they're fighting against or just having to deal with Goliath. Because Goliath's perception, he's not taking David too seriously. And sometimes things can go wrong. Now, my favorite part of the book is your discussion of what you call the enemy image and and how it just sort of read like uh, an item list check off of listening to people talk about foreign policy. So I'd like to get in some of some of those. Uh, but but first of all, what what is the enemy image how, and how does it come from this sort of unipolar? world? Right. Well, the enemy image is a law is, is essentially just a persistent negative perception of another person or another country. And the, the a lot of this came from from research from the Soviet Union and the United States, how did they perceive each other? It's essentially a set of misperceptions, or at least a set of way, a way of thinking about another actor, which through which every by which everything they're going to do, everything they do is perceived negatively. And other actors can't change their image because everything they do is going to be interpreted through the lens of the enemy image. And so it, it, it blocks empathy. It blocks any kind of international reconciliation. And when the enemy image is present in an international relationship, there's a good chance you're on the road to war. You're at least on the road to international rivalry. But when, like right now, the United States and Iran are just seeing each other through that image. 
And there's no way to break that necessarily unless you kind of recognize it's there. And we could be on the road, especially with the particular people running the government now, we might be on the road to some trouble with the Iranians in the future. This enemy image, is it uniform across the people versus their government? So we might think that their their government, the government of Iran is is belligerent and bad in all these ways and no matter what it does – you know, we're always going to read it through that. But do we in general also apply that same thinking to the people of Iran who are, of course, the ones who are going to die when we start a war? With right. Them? No. Generally speaking, we make a, we make a distinction and people make a distinction uh, on both sides we, that we, we like the Iranian people. We understand that we, we tend to think that they're like us, uh, but we, we, we don't like their government. Same thing during the Cold War. You heard all the time. We have nothing against the Soviet people. We know that they're being oppressed by their government. It's their government we don't like. And you hear the same thing going the other direction. You, if, you know, if you've ever traveled through the Arab world, people say all the time, we love the American people. It's the government we don't like. It's, so it's, it's the, the government that's holding back the people. And, and, and right now, you, you could, it's the people in the throes of the enemy image want to help the Iranian people. And the assumption is that the evil lies in the state house. And that that's one of the uh, the ways that it misleads our thinking. Um, one of the ones that I think that is very fascinating that you point out is focusing on intent rather than capability. So if you have this enemy image, you decide that intent is all that matters. Yeah, and it was it was strange during the Cold War. Uh, we we'd say to us a lot of intelligence analysis would come out and say, you know, we don't we really can't know the Soviet intent. What, are they going to strike us first with nuclear weapons, for instance? But so we can't know their intent. So let's just focus on their capability because we all we understand that the threat is some kind of function of capability and intent. So we, but we couldn't tell their intent necessarily. That was controversial. Let's just look at their capabilities. Now it's totally reversed. Now we only look at the Iranian intent and don't look at their capabilities because we, we assume that because the Soviets had a huge capability, the threat was high. Well, now the Iranians have a, very, a minuscule capability. They can't really hurt us in any kind of significant, substantial way, but they want to. Netanyahu talks about all the time, the Iranians want to conquer the world. Well, fine. They're not going to do that, though. The threat for them to do that is zero. Their capability is, is marginal. But we focus instead on the intent. So when you have a very powerful country, you uh, in, in a unipolar system, we don't look at the capability of our potential Enemies like ISIS, his capability was never particularly high. But we, we, if you listen to the news, you listen to our leaders, it sounded like we were, we were fighting against Superman. Uh, the, the threat that they posed was enormous. So it's, if, if we keep in mind that threat is a function of some way of capability and intent, and if either one of those is zero, then the threat is zero. Uh, we don't worry about the English threatening us. They have huge capability, but they have zero intent. So it's the same with the Iranians, very low capability. So even if they wanted to hurt us, even if they wanted to conquer the region, and I'm, by the way, I don't see much signs, of, so many signs that they do. But if they wanted to, they couldn't do it. The threat's very little. Does terrorism change that equation, though? I mean, so that, that we don't have to worry about, say, ISIS invading America and you know taking over the eastern seaboard, but they can still strike us at any time in very acute ways. Right. They, yeah. So, so I mean, so the fact that we have terrorists, that we have international terrorists, and that we have ac they have access to to weapons that can at least hurt us on the micro level and do it in ways that we can't seem to protect against would seem that you know it it doesn't really matter that they don't have a large arsenal. Well, it does if we kind of if I think this is a very important point to try to if we could help keep the terrorist violence in perspective if we realize that the threat that they can pose to us and they can kill people. They can make life miserable for in a, in a, in a, for a brief period of time in a very small area, but they can't do any long term lasting damage to the United States. They can all they can do is really commit an enormous graphic crime, and they would like us to be scared of them. I don't understand why this country is so eager to succumb to terror that the terrorists are trying to to promote. Promote and the the uh, metaphor I would always use. That if, if I were in part, charge of the Department of Homeland Security, I'd be like a stewardess or a flight attendant. If the wing is on fire, the flight attendant's going to say, oh, yeah, the wing's on fire. That's OK. Would you let's sit down, sir? Would you like some peanuts? Instead, our Homeland Security Department says there's a very small chance the wing will explode into flames in the flight. But just sit down and try not to worry about it. So it's the opposite. The, the message should be they, you're not going to die from a terrorist attack. I tell that to people all the time. And they say, how do you know? You don't understand what they, how they think. I say, yeah, but I understand math. 
and no one else seems to around here. And if you do get killed by terrorists, you can come back and haunt me from beyond the grave. Because it, we should, <laughs> we should. Be, the message should be: they cannot do any real harm to us. Rather than we need to be eager, we need to be so vigilant and track them down. That's counterproductive, and that's exactly what they want us to do. So I don't understand why we're so happy and so willing to do exactly what they want us to do. What about the specter? We kind of touched on this before, but everyone I think is thinking, well, what about suitcase nuclear weapons? That, right. That this 0.1% chance of a nuclear weapon is too high. And that if if they want a nuclear, if they got a nuclear weapon, uh, they would want to use it in America. Is I mean, I, I think that, that is, do you agree with that? I mean, maybe not, but, um, but, and that that therefore means we have to be. Well, we, no one would, no one thinks it's a good idea to give nuclear weapons to terrorist groups and to ask them, you know, you guys behave yourselves. But if the, even if they got suitcase nukes and then all of our concern about these suitcase nukes goes back to something a Russian general said during a, a press conference about 15 years ago. And he said, we were missing some suitcase nukes, comrade. And we said, well, what? But it's, number one, they couldn't set them off. It's very difficult for, even if terrorists got nuclear weapons, it's not like there's a button on it that they could push. But and, and, and but let's just go over, you know, go beyond what I think are the pretty much insurmountable technological issues a terrorist group would have in either building or stealing and setting off a nuclear weapon. I, did, I, don't, th I don't think it's possible. But if it did happen, and if a suitcase nuke went off, it would be obviously horrible. And, but it wouldn't be something that we couldn't recover from, however grimly we had to do it. Uh, you know, and it, 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 I don't think the odds, and, it, and if you look into this, I you know, teach weapons of mass destruction classes, and I don't think the odds of this happening are anything to really any realistic kind of concern. But and it's and it's certainly not something that we should be considering going to war to try to prevent. You know, I think in the background, a lot of people's minds, would the Iranians give nuclear weapons to Hezbollah? Uh, it strikes me as very unlikely and not something that we should necessarily be putting at the forefront of our foreign policy. I'd like to go over some of these uh, indicators you list of that you might be suffering from the enemy image problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's almost like a self-help book <laughs> for people. I'll say it's like if, if you checked seven of these boxes, you yeah. might be suffering from the enemy image problem. So first, just a few, you know, some comments on these. Uh, the first one is our differences are fundamental and existential. Right. Yeah. They, we, we are much different from them. I mean, people think and the enemy is fundamentally different from us. At the heart of it is, of course, we're good, they're bad. But what it, during the Cold War was the Soviet evil and we were good. And now it's the sort of radical fundamentalists in, in Tehran, fundamentally evil. There's no point in trying to change them because it's their nature, not their, not something that we can uh, we can make, um, find common ground between us because they're just different and evil. They do not value human life like we do. That's consistent throughout my whole life. I've heard people say, oh, you know, the enemy, whoever it is, was of Japanese Vietnamese, Soviets, certainly. Now Arabs, they don't value human life like we do. That's always wrong. Everybody values human life the same. Uh, but, you know, maybe some leaders could be more callous about it. It's ridiculous to think that we have found, and either the United States is terrible at choosing enemies, and we always choose enemies that have, you know, that no regard for human life, or that's a misperception. That we, and that's a sign that you're, you're not perceiving them properly. You, you're in the throes of the enemy image, buddy. It, I mean, examine what you're thinking. It seems related to that that we, especially Americans, wildly overestimate how much we value human life. Yeah, you know, I it's, mean, it, we we don't tend to value it much true, yeah. if it's not within our shores. And, and the people around the world, especially in the Arab world, think that the United States does not value human life because we sell the the Saudis the ability to try to blow up school buses. So we clearly can't value human life. Their word cannot be trusted. Negotiations are a waste of time. This one sounds right. familiar, especially now. Right. Yeah. North Korea, the skeptics of uh, negotiations as, and those those who are in the throes of the enemy image will say, look, there's no point in talking to them. There was no point in talking to the Soviets in the 1970s when we started say we sat down and had the Salt talks and then and the ABM talks. They, they're going to cheat. There's no point in having these discussions because the enemy can't be trusted. That, more than anything else, more than any other reason, is why the Iran deal, the JCPOA, was, was opposed in so many circles. Because it's not so much they didn't like the deal. They made up reasons. It was, a, from an arms control perspective, an unbelievable deal. But people didn't trust the Iranians. 
and they could never get past that. And they, so any deal with the Iranians was by definition going to be a bad deal. And an old basketball coach said any pass to a bad player is a bad pass. <laughs> and that's the same kind of thing, same kind of thinking that occurs with the Iranians. They, they, that's why they opposed the Iran deal. It had nothing to do with the substance, which because the substance was irrelevant if it was with an, a deal with Iran. The enemy regime is simultaneously dangerous and fragile. Yeah, that's a, there's a paradox here. Because if, if the Iranians, at the one hand, are so strong, then why do we think that uh, some more sanctions will let, make them collapse? The, uh, the, the, paradigm, uh, the, the paragon of this is there's a guy named Michael Ledeen at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, who has been arguing for years that we only need a – if you, you just had a small marine landing in Iran, <laughs> the people would rise up and overthrow the dictator immediately. And, and, and it would, it wasn't would be that Bay a, of Pigs a, too? A bloodless implosion. That was Bay of Pigs too, wasn't it? Right, and yeah, the Bay of Pigs, and uh, uh, it was the, the the groundwork essentially for Iraq that we thought, oh, we show up, we'll be greeted as liberators, everything will be great. But they're so it, dangerous it, too. <laughs> it's 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 this belief that the people are on our side, that there's no such thing as nationalism, that they might not appreciate getting invaded, that uh, that. That, but if, as long as we show up, they will be on our side and we can overthrow their dictators. So their dictators, therefore, are fundamentally insecure and they're fragile. So they're likely to lash out more because they know they have to. People, uh, people objected when President Obama seemingly didn't do much to support the, the Green Revolution in Iran a few years ago. Well, what the heck could we have done? And there's this notion that if we had just made some statements the right way and maybe, you know, parachuted in some supplies. They could have overthrown the regime. This is crazy talk. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's very common among people who think in terms of enemies that they're at the same time dangerous but fundamentally fragile, which is weird, but it's ubiquitous. Following up on that, when, though when we as Americans you know, look out at the world um, and aren't you – know, don't go and visit – on a regular basis, these regimes or have a lot of contact with everyday Iranians or everyday North Koreans, um, the the kind of underlying assumption of the all we need to do is send in Marines is that the – say the reason that the people are supporting their government right now is out of fear, is that you know they, they fear the repercussions of rising up. And so us sending Marines or us you know just going in there would – would kind of show the people that their government is not the threat that they thought it was, and then they would rise up. So is that is that part of the underlying like mistaken assumption? Is it you know if we look at a, a place like North Korea or we look at other governments where we think that you know they're they're brutalizing their own Saudi Arabia, for example, is it not fear of the regime that that keeps the you know fear will keep the systems in line? Um, is it is nationalism a stronger force than we give it credit for? Yeah, it's it's certainly a, a, a an issue that people believe that uh, that and it, it's it's fueled by a variety of different expats people who come out of their countries. It's like um, Ahmed Chalabi came out of Iraq and convinced the Bush administration that every Iraqi will join side of the Marines and they'll fight Saddam Hussein together. But what all that underestimates is nationalism, as much as uh, some if, if the people who are most anti-Trump in the country. If you had some Russian show up or somebody show up and say, hey, let, I'll help you get rid of them, they might say, hey, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Get out. Uh, it, it, the, the, they might not like their leader, but it's their leader, and it's their, it's, it's their problem that they'll deal with. It's very rare that people like to be helped by very heavily armed foreigners, <laughs> unless they're throwing out other heavily armed foreigners. Sure, the French like they, the People said, oh, it'll be like going into Paris in 1944. What are you talking about? They were overthrowing the Nazis. If we had said, "Okay, we're going to put a new regime here," you can't, it's not going to be French. They'd have had a different vote, one would think, <laughs> in 1975 or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number five on the list of ways you might know that you're suffering from the enemy image problem. They are realists. We kind of mentioned this before. They are realists and only understand the language of force. Yeah. How many times? It's always phrased that way too. How many times have you heard somebody say, "You know, the only thing Putin understands is the language is, is force. He is the language of force." What, but that's the way everybody it was it, from the, the beginning of, of my life. I've heard it was from maybe it was Gaddafi and then only the Ayatollah under, only understands force in Eastern Europe. People only understand force. The Chinese right now, we know the only thing they really understand is force. This is crazy. This, the people understand lots of things, but it's all part of this notion that the others are realist. And because he's a realist, 
He, the only thing they really respond to is force. That's the only thing Putin will respond to. That's dangerous because that encourages people to act with force. When a lot of times people understand a language that uses words, too. And they can use they can figure out a language of money, for instance. We have a lot of that. We can get our uh, way a lot of times with money. Turns out the Iranians could understand the language of diplomacy until we screwed up that deal. Everything was working out pretty well. Our various enemies work together. Yeah, there's this notion that especially my favorite example of it was our our former national security advisor who lasted almost three weeks. He had written a book that <laughs> that. Century. Michael Flynn, you're referring to Michael Flynn. Michael yes. Flynn, he he yeah. uh, he unified all of the U.S. enemies into one big anti-U.S. Uh, conspiracy. Essentially, there's a there's a belief system out there. That psychologists refer to this as a closed belief system. The notion that all of our enemies are working together, right, which helps explain, for instance, why we were so we, we were swallowed the notion that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden were going to work together because this is believe all oh, the enemy of the enemy is my friend. Well, OK, but it's not the case necessarily that all of our enemies like one another at the same time. They can turns out they can despise us both pretty equally. Uh, but, but because we know we are good, we assume evil is united. So we think probably the Iranians and Russians are working in cahoots. And ISIS is probably working with the Iranians, even though they're totally opposite in a lot of in the major religious matters. So, but once we think that everybody's working together, then it's us against the world. It's certainly the case with with a lot, especially the neocons. That Robert Kagan talks about how there's a authoritarian axis forming out there. No, 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 I don't really think so. I think that's the once again the enemy image at work. This is one that Trump, I think, recently said or, or used when he described Iran as having a hundred year plan, uh, that which is they are superior strategists who take the long view. Yeah, it's always the case that we, our enemies, they're patient. We we need to have some initial, we, like the, especially the Chinese, they think in terms of millennia. <laughs> no, they don't. It's not the case that they are much better strategists than we are. In fact, it's well known uh, misperception that the enemy is very strategic and very calculating. Well, we know we don't know what the hell's going on. A lot of times, we're we're we're, you know, we're arguing amongst ourselves. We're doing it, taking it one day at a time, reacting to things. But we know Putin; he's a chess player. God, the, the metaphor that drives me crazy: they play chess, we're playing checkers. Morons during the Obama administration, I would occasionally hear, you know what? It's not even checkers. Obama's playing marbles. Okay, fine. But it's not the case necessarily. Maybe it is the case that Putin is thinking five steps ahead and he's a master strategist. Maybe he had no idea that this that his active measures that went on during the 2016 election were going to result in the way they did. And now he doesn't know what to do. It's, it's, it might not be the case that every authoritarian out there is a super genius <laughs> that we are facing a bunch of wily coyotes. <laughs> But that's but that's what the enemy image uh, encourages us to think. They understand us better than we understand them, and they know we are reluctant to use force. This is related to the Reagan quote I read previously. Yeah, that uh, that benevolence that we they know we're good, and that gives them an advantage because they know. For instance, you hear people now say the Iranians know that we're not going to start a war, so they can do whatever they want. They have such an advantage. We don't know that they won't start a war certainly the case they hear all the time during the cold war the soviets had an advantage they know we'll never strike first what they had no and we know now they were more scared of us striking first than we were because we generally had a military advantage but the our enemies know us and they know we're good uh which and which is just demonstrably wrong no one thinks the other side is good in fact they generally think that we're realists too it takes a foreign policy expert, quote unquote, to understand their true nature. I like this one a lot. Yeah, there's there's after 9-11, experts on Islam popped up all over the place, just like during the Cold War. There were experts on the Soviet Union. A lot of them, the, the neoconservative movement in the 1970s, a lot of them were former Trotskyites, people who were deep, hip deep once upon a time in communist theory. So they'd say, oh, you have to really understand how they think to really understand them. And, you, and so people were digging after 9-11 after into the sort of intellectual precursors of, of Osama bin Laden and trying to really understand how they're thinking and the threat they pose. And it, it, it's never the case that people who in the defense business who get into the mind of the other figure out, you know, it's, he's not too bad. It's always that they're super evil. 
and that they and in order to really understand the extent of their evil, you can't really just read the news and figure it out on your own. You need the experts because the experts in the def in defense circles generally are ha more hawkish than everybody else. And Leslie Gale before 9-11 famously said, look, I, I ended up supporting the war in Iraq. I'm sorry, not before 9-11, before the war in Iraq. I ended up supporting the war because of professional pressure. Everybody was supporting the war. I didn't want to be on the outside. So it so experts tend to be more hawkish, and especially particular experts with particular expertise, which is a stupid way of saying experts with expertise, but uh, they, they tend to be more hawkish than the average person do, that's for sure. But does this mean then that we should only look to the average person's opinion? I mean, so like, no. yeah, so like if it's I'm, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, there's there's a foreign policy issue going on in Ghana and you were to ask me, like, I don't know anything about Ghana, wh whether I know foreign policy there or not. And so you wouldn't want to ask me. So you're saying we should should we look to different sorts of experts? Yeah, yeah, I think. And, and the, the if you imagine a Venn diagram, the more the most dangerous area in the middle there is when you have right, sort of conservative or right wing or at least uh, hawkish political ideology and expertise overlapping. When you have experts surrounding the president, for instance, who are both the, of a neoconservative background, because it's almost it, it, hawkishness is pretty much one of the central parts of that identity or some definitions of a neoconservative and an expertise in the in in, in another country, uh, then those are the ones who are going to be exceptionally hawkish and exceptionally likely to, to recommend a military solution to problems. Rather than say a cooperative one, because they and, and they're most likely in, in particular to just see life through the enemy image. And I feel like I'm doing David Letterman here. And number ten on the list of ways you might <laughs> yeah. know that you're suffering from the enemy image problem is they are Nazis. Yeah, if there's one marker, as soon as people are referring to the other side as Nazis, they're probably not using some you know, a good way to perceive the other. That, and and it's it's everybody's been a Nazi since I have been in uh, old enough to understand the, the, these debates it's from Saddam Hussein and, and Islamo Nazi or Islamo fascists we used to hear it all the time you know, not so not so common now perhaps but they, these are just the next version of Nazis fortunately there's only one version of Nazis and no and they combined intent and capability. Uh, and so they were a threat. But luckily, those ones, even if we don't like them, most of the most of our potential enemies out there don't have one or the other. So speaking of people often accused of being a Nazi, um, let's talk about our, our current president. Uh, so looking so given the the kind of framework that you have articulated in the book and that we've discussed today, and then given what you see in the current administration, how do you see the next several years playing out? Do you think that things, I mean, are going to get? Is there any chance they're going to get better? Are they going to get worse? Well, there's no chance of things getting better in the sense because all the stuff we've been talking about so far, very very little of it applies to Donald Trump because it would assume that he is thinking about anybody else or thinking about other countries. And I think you know if you go back and read these diagnostic tools that psychiatrists have, psychologists have, and look up the narcissistic personality disorder. It's like it was written for Donald Trump. And it, so there's no chance this guy is going to change it all and get better. It's it, and, and But it doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to fall apart. And I've been writing recently, it's talking about how what we're doing right now, we're having a massive test of the international system. We're going to find out what norms and rules are actually going to be persistent. We're going to have a test of, say, the overall downward trends in violence that we talked about before. Because if, if everything, if these, whatever survives the next few years of Trump are going to be the things that are probably be more persistent and more, more lasting than, and, than, than others. Because if, if they can survive the Trump years, if, the, if there's still less violence around the world, if it's democratic order still holding together, after the Trump years, then maybe we can have say with some confidence that that might be around for a while. Uh, but it, for now, it's a little bit like, you know, if your team is in the NCAA tournament, you just the early rounds, you just kind of want to survive in advance. And that's what I feel about the Trump years. We're just going to try to survive in advance. And maybe at some point, maybe it'll be over. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, 
please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.